Hello and good evening, good night, morning, afternoon, whichever part of the world you are watching this from. Let me share something with you before I formally announce our guest and uh, welcome her. Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald Kennedy was the matriarch of the Kennedy family. She raised nine children. One was President John F. Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy, longtime Senator Ted Kennedy, diplomat, activist, and humanitarian Jean Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, Eunice Kennedy, who was a philanthropist who founded Special Olympics and won the Presidential Medal for Freedom. Rose Kennedy was full-time homemaker, and in her autobiography, she stated that she felt completely fulfilled as a homemaker. Here's what she said in her autobiography that I want to read out. Before that, let me just quickly share my screen because it will be good for you to see what we have got. So in the autobiography, Rose said, I looked on child rearing not only as a work of love and a duty, but as a profession that was fully as interesting and challenging as any honorable profession in the world, and one that demanded the best I could bring to it. What, great, what greater aspiration and challenge can be there for a mother than the hope of raising a great son or daughter? I haven't heard a more powerful word or statement on parenting than this. For Rose Kennedy, motherhood was a mission for her life to raise honorable children who would contribute positively to society. And boy, did she succeed in her mission. We often shine a light on the successful individual, not knowing the varied forces that may have played a role to shape him up. And not very often we pay heed to the parents who may have contributed to the individual success. Today, we have with us the modern day Rose Kennedy, Esther Wojitsi, who has raised three phenomenally successful daughters. Susan Wojitsi, who is the YouTube CEO, Anne Wojitsi, who is the founder and CEO of 23andMe, and Janet Wojitsi, who is a UCSF doctor and researcher. She authored two books, How to Raise Successful people and moonshots education, and she has rightfully earned herself the moniker of being the godmother of Silicon Valley. Esther herself has had an amazing career. She's the CEO of globalmoonshots.org. She's the advisory council of the Creative Commons, founder of Palo Alto Hike Journalism, contributed and actively active contributor to Huffington Post. She has the on honorary doctorate from Palo Alto University and from Rhode Island School of Design. She also has mentored Steve Jobs' daughter, Lisa uh, Brennan, in her high school. Esther has won the Northern California Journalism Teacher of the Year and was selected as California Teacher of the Year in 2002. She has been chairman and heads of many educational boards. In fact, I'm skipping a lot of her other achievements because I could fill an entire hour just reading all of her achievements out. So I can't contain my excitement to have her in this conversation. But before that, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, I give you three seconds to press the subscribe button and share the live link on your social media. Because the more people subscribe, the YouTube algorithms help you reach to more audience and it's quite funny because uh, i have with me the mother of youtube ceo and i'm also more motivated when more people watch this um, and the other announcement that we have today is we are also doing a free book giveaway for easter's book how to raise successful people and easter is going to pick one of you based on your questions or engagement during the interview so i'm going to going to be uh, I, putting those questions on the screen so that everybody is able to see those questions. And uh, then we we can see if we can pick them up for Easter to answer them. So with that, let's welcome our guest, Easter. Let me bring her to the stream here. Hello, so, Easter. So, so, Driven Life YouTube channel. How are you doing today? I must say I'm so honored 
and I must thank you so much for that incredible introduction and my comparison to this woman who is, an, she is a model and I love her and what she did and the way that she raised her children and her philosophy in life. So thank you so much for this in, incredible introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here on your show with you, Ravi. Thank you. I could not uh, contain, I mean, I, I could not help you compare with her because the first thing that came to my mind when Rajesh introduced uh, us was uh, Madam Kennedy. So thank you, thank you for being here. So let me begin by, before we ask about uh, the topic today, which is raising successful children, I would like to know about you in little detail. I would like to understand with you deeply what were your growing up years like and what shaped you as an, an individual. You said your parents were Russian Jewish uh, immigrants who moved to US. So tell us uh, a bit about that. So my, my parents had a very difficult childhood themselves in Russia. And so that's one of the reasons they decided to come to the United States. You know, people don't get up and leave their homes unless they really have, are having a difficult time and they see another country or another lifestyle as much better. So when they arrived here in the United States, it was unfortunately in the middle of the depression. And uh, so it wasn't quite as wonderful as they thought it would be because they had a hard time um, earning money and a hard time um, you know, getting an education and then they had to learn English. So that was kind of tough for them. Also, my father was an artist. And if you just know anything about the life of an artist, you know, you don't earn a lot of money. So that was a, a part of the problem for him. And then my mother hadn't yet graduated from high school. So, you know, she didn't have an opportunity to work. And working in those days was not considered okay for women. It was, you stayed home and you took care of your children. So um, I was the first one born in the United States and everybody cheered and they were really excited. Um, we moved from New York City to Los Angeles. And at that time, Los Angeles was primarily farms. Hard to believe that. This was in the 1940s. Uh, no, it's like about 47, 48. Um, and it was a pretty nice place to grow up. It was rural. And, um, and I went to school, to a public school, a regular public school. But um, during that time, actually, we continued to have financial problems and continued to have a lot of other issues. And I realized that the only way out of poverty and the only way out of the problems that I was suffering was education. And I figured this out when I was about 10 years old, um, which I thought was already old at that point, but turns out it's pretty young. And so I spent a lot of time in the library, a lot of time working with um, teachers, a lot of time just trying to make myself as educated as possible. And I, that really worked. Um, by the time I was 18, I was, uh, was graduating from high school and um, all my education passion paid off and I, I was elected the valedictorian of this class and it was a pretty big class. So I was honored to be there. And then I got a scholarship to University of California at Berkeley, where I majored in political science and English literature. And I got a master's degree in journalism and also a teaching credential. And that really set me on the road to at least not having a life of poverty, which is what I wanted to escape. And um, I think that is something that I try to spend a lot of time teaching everybody that if you can be educated and you can learn something that you personally would like to to do in life it can make a big difference and a lot of the people that are in poverty one of the problems is that they don't really have any job skills and uh, so that's my goal has been to try to educate people um, and that's what i've done as a teacher and also that's what i've done as a journalist so as a journalist, I'm always busy writing articles. As a matter of fact, I have a new website I'd love to invite you to join. It's called wajway.com, W-O-J-W-A-Y 
www.ellenbarnett.com. And what I do on that is I have uh, once a week, I write a blog on how to cope most effectively in this pandemic and what parents can do and what teachers can do to make it an easier, easier transition for our kids during a time when it's really difficult. So um, that's, the, that's my main, that's sort of the background to my, um, to how I got to where I am today. Thank you, Esther, for sharing that inspiring uh, background story. Uh, no wonder um, your, your life uh, came out and transformed the way it did. So let's let's uh, go go to the book now. Uh, when the book says raising successful children, what does the term successful mean in your definition? Because I I got a few questions from some of the parents asking, what does success mean? Does it mean competitive success? Does it mean materialistic su uh, success? Does it mean um, so? If if you can define what success means for you, that would be a great start for this conversation. So that's a great question, and a lot of people ask that question. And uh, of course, the answer is explained in the book. It's 300 pages long, so it's going to take a little bit of time for you to read it. But it, it reads pretty quickly. Most people say that it's a very easy read, and that's primarily because it's stories, and people love stories. And um, then to back up the research that I did, I use a story, and uh, then of course you can find the research as well. But <clears throat> but success to me means that you feel supported in whatever it is to follow your dreams, and that you are able to pursue that path with the support of your family or with the support of a mentor or the support of your teacher or some close friends because little kids they all have a dream and frequently that dream is crushed by the parents who say that oh this is not a good idea no you cannot do that and um and then they put up obstacles in the way to make sure that you know that dream that the child might have is really modified to the dream that the parents have. So I think one thing that would be good for parents to do is to talk with their children about what they think would be a good dream for the child. And, and instead of just um, making it difficult for the child to achieve that dream, if there can be discussion, maybe the dream, maybe the child will modify those plans, depending on, you know, the information that they got. But so that the, they can follow their dream. And that dream includes not necessarily having, you know, an important big title, but more so it involves being able to um, have a nice place to live and have enough money to buy the food that you need and enough money to have the clothing that you need. So it doesn't mean me being a billionaire. It means living a life of meaning where you have a purpose and a goal and where you can have the support and the money to achieve that goal. And um, so, you know, as a teacher, you can imagine that um, I never tried to become a billionaire <laughs> because teachers don't earn a lot of money. But my dream was to help other people to, to learn as much as they could learn and to be as best as they could be. And I achieved that dream. And fortunately, along the way, at least, we always had enough money to buy a house and to live in a, to have enough food and to have enough nice clothing. And uh, we were not super rich, but we tried to pass along this um, passion to make the world a better place to all three of our daughters. <clears throat> so my husband, he's also a teacher, but he was teaching at Stanford University. He's a professor of physics. He was chairman of the Stanford Physics Department for many years. And he did a lot of research in high energy particle physics and in neutrino physics. And that was his dream. 
And he never worried about when he when he focused on it, he never worried about, oh, is that gonna make me a really rich person? He was really more interested in what he could do to somehow solve some of the questions that people had asked in physics. And um, but we were very lucky because we both together earned enough money to have a house, a nice house. By the way, I still live in the same house. We haven't moved in spite of the fact that my children are extremely wealthy. Um, I like my neighborhood. I like the house, have sentimental reasons to want to stay in the house. And honestly, you know, you don't need to have a huge house to be happy. So um, that that is a long answer to a short question that Ravi asked about what does success mean? <laughs> Oh, that was that was a good answer, though. Um, just that um, I was once encountered by a question on uh, how much can you pressurize your kid to chase success? Because ultimately, it could lead to a rat race where only a few can be at the top of a field or a profession, right? Uh, so chasing excellence is good, but when can you take it easy? And when can you, uh, so there's that, there is a spectrum being extremely competitive and pushing your child to, to, to operate at that level and take it easy and not make it competitive so that uh, it just does not take, suck the life out of uh, the, their life. So what, how would you uh, differentiate or tra make the trade-offs there? You know, I, that's such a great question because parents are asking this all the time. You know, you know they they've already made their own mistakes, and they're like, "I want to make sure my child does not make the same mistakes, and is able to achieve this goal in life that they want and that I want for them." Uh, so I think it's very hard to come up with a definitive answer on this. But one thing that is really important for people to know is that the children are growing up in a very different world than you grew up in. And they're smart. They're smart because they have your DNA. And, you know, you're probably pretty smart yourself. And they, if you believe in them, honestly, they will believe in themselves. And I've, I've one person that I've spent time with and that I met who really illustrates this in many ways is um, Elon Musk. And I've spent a lot of time with Elon Musk and with his mother, who's a great person as well. And Elon was not a great student. As a matter of fact, he got a lot of D's and a lot of, he, some classes even flunked. And when I talked to him about it, he said he really did not like school because he had a lot of ideas that he wanted to pursue and school did not offer that as an opportunity for him. And so he became, um, it was a rebel. And he, when he started out, I mean, with his ideas and his company and everything, I mean, he was didn't have very much money. I think he had $2,500 to start out. But his mother, and I think it's part of the reason because she didn't have a lot of time, she supported whatever he wanted to do. She was busy as a model. She didn't, she had gotten a divorce. So she didn't have a lot of uh, time on her hands. And so she supported whatever Elon wanted to do. And of course, as you see today, he's amazingly successful and revolutionary. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say that for all parents, you know, that you're going to end up with somebody that's going to be like Elon Musk. But what you are going to end up with is creative thinkers. And you want to empower those kids as long as possible. And I mean, in India, for example, India has probably the most talented engineering pool in the world. More great engineers come out of India than anywhere. And um, that is one thing that I'm, I'm hoping to do is to provide an engineering curriculum for schools in India that are going to have more peer-to-peer -peer learning that will in empower kids as opposed to discourage them in many ways. Um, so the information on that will come later and I'll be happy to share that with Robbie when we're more, when we're closer to having that, um, that program start. 
Um, but I do, I do think that it's really important to give your child an opportunity to believe in their dreams. And I can't emphasize that enough. You don't want them to be living a life where they regret not having done what they wanted to do. Excellent. So your book has a model called Trick. It's yes. for trust, respect, independence, collaboration, kindness. And uh, when I when I read them out, uh, they looked nice to have values for being a good human being. But I thought, and especially this comes from Indian mentality of competitiveness, I thought to succeed in life, the uh, things like trust, kindness, these are very fluffy and soft skills. Uh, and I thought uh, cut cutthroat competitiveness is required, and this is what Indian parents focus on more. I I, I don't think we focus or even we teach our children that to succeed, you need to be more kind or, or more uh, trusting. Um, so I just wanted to, I mean, uh, so this, this came across as very, very uh, unconventional for, uh, for Indians. That's so right. Your thoughts on that. How did you pick on these five elements or, or core values for success? So I'll go through each one of these. So trust, very briefly, very briefly, and then I have. I'll go through trust, just briefly. When you trust a child to do something, what that does is says to the child, "Oh, I trust myself to do it. I am capable of doing that because my mom and my dad believe in me." And it can be just little things like I trust them to go to the store buy the food that I have on the list and come back with the right amount of money. That And so that says to the child, my parents trust me. And so as they get older, the more responsibilities that you give them, the more trust you have for them, the more trust they have in themselves. And what happens with a lot of people whenever they try to do something, the last person they trust is themselves. They're always asking other people, what do you think of my idea? Do you think it's a good idea? And you know, you take other people's thoughts and ideas more seriously than you take your own because you're un you are just unsure of yourself because if your parents are constantly in a position of making you distrust your judgment, you distrust yourself. So, I mean, I can go through each one of these. Uh, they all work together. You know, trust and respect are combined together. When you trust and respect a child, you give them more independence. You collaborate with them. And if they make a mistake, you treat them with kindness. And there's a lot of people out there that don't even know what kindness is. I mean, we've been, unfortunately, in such a situation where we're just for not very kind to each other and kindness we need kindness in the world today this is a world where we're all facing this incredible pandemic and we need to work together and treat each other with kindness and all this fighting that's going on in the international level between one country and another is not doing anybody any good it's ridiculous we're all human beings and we all need to treat each other with kindness and um, I mean, I can't emphasize this more enough. And every morning when I wake up, I do a newsletter. And every morning, there's a lot of fighting going on in the world. And it makes me depressed. So um, hopefully, I will get this message across that we will all be better off if we can be kind to each other in many ways. And some, I can tell you some of the simple things for kindness can be just things like, smiling at somebody or offering to help them you know get some groceries just very small things um so i have a an acronym a um a company i'm working with called area nine lyceum and they did a um a whole module on what it is to be kind lyceum. and know. they did a um Sorry, go ahead. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that people could find that. It's uh, called Area 9 Lyceum, and it's a module on kindness. And I think if you just type my name in and kindness in the search bar, you will find it. 
because um, I worked on this because I see so many people that are not kind to each other and we need, and it could be really simple things to do to make our world a better place. Um, so that's, that's, those are the five um, qualities, characteristics. And it's interesting what you said, Robbie, earlier, you said it feels fluffy. <laughs> and a lot of people think it feels fluffy. But let me tell you, if you are on the receiving end of trust and respect and kindness, you don't think it's very fluffy. Well, that's, that's, that's correct. And a lot many people, especially in India, I mean, we do not work a lot on building uh, these aspects of our personality. As a result, sometimes uh, it's not your personality is not well-rounded. And most of these uh, values are needed when you want to reach to the very top. Otherwise, it's 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 not a it's it's not a complete uh, fully formed uh, human being is what I feel. Um, I will I'll go a little deep on trust and respect and briefly on the other ones. So uh, you said in the book that living without trust is miserable. It makes us dysfunctional. We become so fearful and anxious, and we pass this fear to our kids. And uh, so trusting the kid is very important, as you just mentioned. But uh, why is trust such an important core value to, to preserve uh, so that they, they become they not become fearful? And the reason I, I say is you, you also said majority of people are trustworthy. And the, the reason people are more careful and not trusting is, for example, let's go to 9-11, right? The world became less trustworthy because two aeroplanes hit the 9-11 buildings and it was a rare occurrence but that led to a phenomenon where security measures came up and the world changed after that so there was less trust and even though we know that majority of people are trustworthy uh, we know in rare occasions they will not be trustworthy and that's the reason most people are very safe in uh, for the children in terms of trust so how do you uh, navigate this uh, dichotomy between uh, being trustworthy and being uh, careful so that's it's a great question it's also a very scary question at the moment uh 9 11 what it did is ushered in a whole decade of fear fear about everything. Uh, we were more fearful after 9-11 than ever before. Today, if you can believe it, it's even worse. There's even more fear today than there was before. There's fear that we don't get the right news. There's fear that, um, especially coming from Washington, that President Trump is saying and doing things that are not true. Uh, there is fear that the CDC, uh, which is the Disease Control Center, Center for Disease Control, is giving the wrong information. There's fear that not wearing a mask is a good idea or a bad idea. I mean, the world has gone absolutely crazy in terms of fear. And um, it makes everybody unhappy and miserable. So that's just one aspect of it. But if imagine that you're living in a small home or a small apartment and you don't trust the people that you're living with. I mean, I can't imagine being in a situation that would be worse than that because you can, it limits your freedom. I mean, if you can't trust, you can't function. So starting with the home, you need to be able to trust the people that you're living with, of course, and then trust your family and trust your friends and believe in them. Uh, that is just, that's critical for life. And um, because if you're not trusting, you're always fighting. And you know what happens to people that fight all the time? First, your blood pressure goes up and then you have all kinds of physical health problems you live a shorter life and you're miserable. So, I mean, just starting from the center there, you know, most people, fortunately, they still have 
families that they trust and love and, you know, even bigger families. And you want to extend this to your city. One of the reasons that my classes in Palo Alto at Palo Alto High School, which were really huge classes, I mean, the ratio of student to teacher was one to 70. So I had 70 kids in a class. Um, today, by the way, it's the largest media program in the United States where there's over 700 kids and six other teachers. And they, those teachers and those other classes also follow the same principles that I set up, which is trust and belief in your students. And I trust students so much that I give them the opportunity to lead the class the majority of time. And I give, of course, they learn a lot from me, but a lot of that is learned independently and I learned from also my co-teacher um, that I have now. I have, like I told you, six other teachers and they all have the same pedagogy, same philosophy. And um, so what, what empowers all those kids to want to learn and want to produce publications that are actually ranked at the top of the United States? It's because of a I trust them and I believe in them and I respect them. And that helps them trust and believe in themselves. And when they make mistakes, they work together. They're part of a community. They feel comfortable asking other kids in the program to help them or ask the teacher to help them. They're not afraid of making mistakes because mistakes are part of school. As a matter of fact, my theory and the what, what I say in my classes is if you're not making a mistake, you shouldn't be here. You must already know how to do it. Because if you're here in my class, you need help and you need to know how to do it. And so I expect you to make mistakes. I don't give grades until the student has mastered it. So it's called mastery learning system. And the same can go for parents at home. You know, be be understanding when children make a mistake. You know, give them an opportunity to do it again. Don't get so upset. I know that parents tend to get really upset because, you know, I'm surrounded by parents. And also I had my own parents who didn't follow this philosophy. They came from Russia. So they got really upset, you know, when I made mistakes. And, um, and so that... I'm trying to work against this to make you as a parent and your children have just a happier life, more successful. By the way, just one more thing. This is how I brought my daughters up. Everybody asks, what did you do with your daughters? And this is it. They got to make a lot of mistakes and I always supported them. Thank you, Esther. So we have a few questions already pouring in i will ask you one question at my end from the from the from the first chapter on trust and then we'll open up for uh, our listener question so one of the challenge so this is on trust and the trusting your ability to parent well to your kid and one challenge many parents feel is the feeling of inadequacy uh, that they might not be good enough parent to raise a child to be successful. They might not be the best parents. So what are the ways to overcome this sense of inadequacy to be a better parent? That's exactly why I wrote the book, because <laughs> I'm trying to help all parents believe in themselves. And the main thing that they need to do is to give their child an opportunity to try new things and you, the parent, support that. And you help, and kindness is the key. I can tell you, uh, Maya Angelou, a, f a famous American author, wrote this quote, which I have been quoting. I didn't even realize she was the one that originally said it. People will forget what you did. They'll forget what you said. But they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that is what you need to remember for your child. If they try something difficult and they don't succeed, 
how they feel about themselves is what is important. And that's what you, the parent, and you don't have to be educated to do it. You can just be loving. And that's where kindness comes in. Kindness, love, appreciation, um, compassion, empathy. Those are the things. Those are the things that computers will never learn. Never. So stop trying to make your child into a computer because we don't want human computers. We want human beings that have these social emotional skills. I, I'll tell you, I would rather work with somebody who has these human characteristics that I can teach something about uh, c computer science to than somebody who is perfectly a, a genius at computer science but lacks social emotional skills. You can't work with those people, unfortunately. Got it. So it's time to take some uh, viewer questions. Uh, so we have a few questions. I will post it uh, live on screen. And uh, is that you, you can choose which one you want to answer first. So here is uh, Puniam Patnaik. He's uh, uh, a dear friend of mine, my old classmate. So I'm just reading it out. Hi, Esther. I have a seven-year-old son. You spoke about supporting the dreams of our kids. At what age do you think a kid understands what he really dreams about his future? Uh, in short, yeah, when can you know he's serious about what he dreams? Well, I wouldn't take a seven-year-old's dreams too seriously. Um, I would let him pursue his dreams, of course but he will change them on his own. You, you don't have to do anything to, to help him change his dreams and become more realistic. As he gets older and gets more information and learns about a, different, a lot of different things, he will change his, his, his goals. Uh, I mean, I can remember when I was growing up, most little boys wanted to be firemen. <laughs> hey, nobody wants to be a fireman today. <laughs> and so, you know, People change and kids change, and he's only seven. I mean, in seven years, the world will change, and I'm sure he'll change his mind. So whatever he wants to be today is fine. It doesn't matter. He'll he'll modify it, and, and don't take it too seriously. You know, don't encourage him to do something. Just let him do it. But what what age? His question was: At what age do you think you should be? collaborating with him to towards a vision of the future? T teenage years, 13, 14, 15. At those, at those ages, first of all, they can get around pretty well. Their bodies are usually physically developed. And then they ha have a lot of the skills, their reading skills, writing skills, think they've practiced a little bit. So I would start with them at age 13, 14. And... Um, and then, you know, I would continue to talk to them about whatever it is their dream is. But, um, you know, you need to be uh, sensitive to the fact that um, their dream might be different than your dream. And I know, I think in Indian culture, the children are very respectful of the parents and the grandparents. And I wish that all cultures would be like that. Um, but I think in the fact, while you want to encourage this, you also want to give your child an opportunity to pursue their dream. Got it. Thank you so much. So here's uh, Sonal Pathak. Uh, and Sonal is from the US. So she's in, from Dallas. And her question is, uh, how can you drive these qualities, trust, respect, kindness amongst kids in general, when in middle school, kids suffer a lot of bullying and not everyone in the group would be respectful and kind. <clears throat> so in an environment of disrespect and bullying, how can you still be kind and uh, trustful and respectful? So my theory, it's, it's a real problem in middle school. And I think one of the problems is that uh, the kids are afraid to tell the teachers. And the reason they're afraid to tell the teachers or afraid to tell anyone is because the punishment is so severe. And so they endure this bullying instead of reporting it. But I think if a teacher can work with the person that's bullying, the person that's being the bully is usually the person who has the lowest self-esteem. And that's part of the reason they're so 
poorly behaved. So um, if you can, if the teacher can make it clear that it's okay to tell me and that the punishment is not going to be that severe, um, you know, it's going to be more a situation where you're working with the bully and talking to him about, I'm sure that bully also has feelings. And um, that is one of the reasons actually that I never refer students to the main office ever because the punishment is terrible. They can be suspended. So instead, I always have kids stay after school with me, talk about what they did, write about it. They actually have to write right then and there. I keep them after school for maybe two hours. I have to write about what they did and how that might have hurt other people or created problems or whatever they did. And I find that that is the most effective way um, to deal with them is when you talk to them and work with them. So I think a lot of um, a lot of people feel this is impossible because there's a lot of bullying online and a lot of bullying that you know the teacher is not aware of, and so forth. It's the middle school years are tough years because there are is a lot of a lot of bullying that goes on, and you need to explain that to your kids and talk about you know if they're the subject of bullying how that is just, you know, a bad time period, a difficult time period for growing up and that it will change as they get older. Uh, I mean, it's it's not fun. And I know that don't take it seriously ever. You mean that if you're the subject of a, a being bullied, boy. Thank Sorry. you. Nasty. <laughs> um. There is another question from Vikas, and Vikas has a question on passion, and uh, it's, it's very relevant. So he's the father of two children, a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old girl. His question is, you, you talked about teenagers, right? But yeah. some teenagers could also be lost, so they, they might not find it easy to find that passion. So how can you make it easy for kids to find out that passion so that they can work on them? So most of the time, that when kids have a hard time finding their passion, it's because they feel judged. They feel like if they pick something, people will laugh at them. And so what you want to do is make it clear that whatever they pick, it's okay. And if they want to change their mind after they pick it, that's okay too. And I think there's just a lot of choice out there and they're worried that they will pick the wrong thing or that people will, their par their parents or the grandparents or whoever will laugh at them. And so you just, that's it. I mean, I can tell you my daughter's, Susan, she graduated from school, from college. First of all, she majored in history and lit. And, and then the question I asked her when she graduated was, so now what do you want to do with that? And she said she didn't know. And I said, well, okay, well, what are you going to do? And she spent a, quite a while trying to figure it out, uh, quite a while being, a, you know, several months. And then, you'll be happy to know, those of you in India, she decided what she wanted to do was go to India for a year. <laughs> and she flew off to India, to Delhi, by herself, not she only had two friends that she had met in college and she loved being in india actually i had to try to force her to come back um so i mean there's no way to to tell you know what the right age is going to be and how to how to help them develop their passion um because you know her passion was history and lit and then she went to India and she changed her mind. She worked for a magazine called India Today. Mm. And um, yeah, to this day, she loves India. So hopefully someday we'll be able to travel and go back again. <laughs> but um, that's just an example that, you know, even when they've graduated from college, they may not know exactly what they want to do. I should tell you, all three of my daughters were in that same position. They were not sure of what they wanted to do, but they felt 
uh, supported by their parents to try anything. Got it. So um, with, with, with the topic we are in now, and you mentioned about your your daughter went to India and how risky it was for her to go and the protective mother in you uh, wanted to take care of her and uh, the other instance was when one of your daughters were also in South Africa, Johannesburg and she was working for the for an NGO there and you knew it wasn't very safe there and the protector mother in you also wanted to protect her. Um, so the idea of risk, okay, uh, how, how much risk should a ch child be exposed to and you made a profound statement in your book which says that your child needs to take risk not many parents instinct instinctively resist the idea too many parents instinctively resist the idea so could you shed some light on how much risk should we expose our child to you know i think the question is alone um, is part of the answer should you expose your child to you don't expose your child to any to the risk it's the child that is taking the risk and um so yes it was very stressful for me for my daughter to fly off to india there were no cell phones you know there was no way for me to know if she got there okay um you know we used to have these aerograms she would write a letter and you know, it took two weeks. If there was a problem, I, I, I was the last person to know there was a problem. Um, you know, I believed in her that she could do it. After a while, you as a parent, there you cannot trust, you cannot um, protect your kid from everything. You just can't do it. And there's an epidemic now in the United States where they all want their children to have phones. All the parents want, they, every kid has a phone. You know, they're like six years old in school and they've got a phone. Why does the parent want the child to have a phone? Because if there's an active shooter, we have this active shooter problem, right? Then they want to be able to have the child call home. I mean, honestly, if if there's an active shooter in, on the campus, what is that parent who's living even two or three miles away going to do, you know? So we have this um, myth that we believe in that we can always protect our child from everything. My goal as a parent back then, when Susan went to India, Janet went to South Africa, and went to Russia, well, I thought to myself, I've taught them everything I can possibly teach them about being sensible, taking care of themselves, being able to think their way through difficult times, and now I just have to trust them. And that's what I did. It was very difficult, I must say. Um, but, you know, the experience that Susan had in India was was great. Um, you know, to this day, I don't know if there were any terrible challenges. She never really shared it with me. Um, Janet in South Africa was the most dangerous place outside a war zone in Johannesburg at that time. She... And the one thing I did realize is that when she got there, she couldn't find a place to to stay or live. And so she ended up renting someone's garage. Can you imagine living in a garage for like a month? You know, she made it through. She seems fine today, you know. Um, your children, they are going to be able to think their way out of whatever it is if you believe in them and trust them. And I mean... Look, today is Susan's biggest challenge is YouTube and how YouTube impacts the world. There is nobody there that did it before her. She has to think her way through this. And and Anne, the same thing with 23andMe, personal genetics. You know, it's, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. Um, the world that we all live in today is a challenge. So... I think, I think it's hard. Getting back to your original question, it's very tough on the mothers. Very tough. You just have to have faith that your child is going to be able to negotiate and that you taught them everything that they need to know. They are going to be able to do it the way that you would have done it if you would have been there by their side. Right, and and being exposed to risks early on prepares them for 
for success and for challenges in the future so that they can handle it all by themselves instead yes. of right and Anne went to 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 russia she managed to get herself lost in siberia without being able to speak russian you know this was a challenge trust me you know um but you know they made it through and they you you will never learn to swim if you're never in a swimming pool right thank you uh, one last question on trust as i said i'm just picking few topics but going deep there uh, the question on broken trust and you said that uh, whatever you do as a parent your child will end up violating your trust at some point kids should take an active step to repair the trust they have broken that's so, right that so kids kids need to know when they broke they know actually when they've broken your trust and you can say something about it and i think it's important to instill early in their life that when they do something that breaks the trust or do something that is inappropriate that if they apologize that you then that opens the conversation and that you can forgive i think people are afraid to admit they've made mistakes or afraid to admit they've broken your trust if the punishment is so se severe that that they can't funk, cope with it so if they break your trust and your response is going to be i'm going to break off my relationship with you of course they will never tell you that they broke their trust your trust i mean the you have to be you as a parent have to be willing to move forward and to forgive and to um help them understand that this was a bad thing that happened and you don't want it to happen again but there you you're willing to trust them again i mean what's the alternative not trusting them developing a bad relationship being mean i don't see how that's a good alternative um and you as the parent you're the leader you know you have to provide this example and give them that opportunity to apologize to apologize and that you have to accept that apology excellent before we move to respect uh i would like to take a few more questions here so we have a few questions this comes from uh chandana chandana is also a, a dear friend and uh, let's beam her question here how did you balance your own career and parenting uh, you have done such a fabulous job a love and hugs to you i took a break from work and i'm looking to get back you are my inspiration so it's it's a comment and also a question there and i also had this question let's let me uh, add that to this one and it says uh does being a uh, maintaining a career of your own make you a less effective parent than a full time parent as a homemaker so th those are great questions thank you for the question um so when my children were little that means when they were born they were five, three kids in 5 years is what i had and um i stayed home at that point cuz it was just too much i couldn't work at the same time and also this was in the 1970s and women didn't work outside the home if you did there was something very um peculiar about you and um so that also was an era just i'd like to remind a lot of women that in the 1970s i could not get a credit card in my name and uh the things have really dramatically improved for women uh so i stayed home i went back to work when they were in elementary school so as soon as ann was in kindergarten i went back to work i think today there is there more supports for parents to work so they didn't even have daycare back then that i could you know that just didn't exist um and so i think it is a good idea for women to continue their jobs while there are parents 
And I think that depends a lot on the daycare that's offered. So if you can get a good daycare provider, um, and it can be somebody that comes to your home, or it can be um, a small daycare, I'm actually not a fan of these large daycares that have hundreds of kids. Um, I think that I support a group called We Care, um, and what they're doing is they help set up daycares in homes. So, you know, grandparents or people that don't have um, a lot of responsibility at this point and want to be a daycare provider. It gives them the opportunity to be a daycare provider. And um, so you take in maybe four, five, six kids, and then, you know, then it gives the mother an opportunity to go back to work and not worry about your child. Uh, I think being a, a career mother also sends a message to your child that it's okay to, for them to um, grow up and to trust other people as well, to be their caretakers, and for the mom to also have a career. So that sends a, a model role, a role model signal to a child that it, that is okay. And I should tell you, all three of my daughters have followed this. They all have daycare or they have had a, a nanny at home and Susan with YouTube actually when um, she was at Google to start and she is the person behind all the daycare facilities at Google and there's a lot of them there's hundreds of daycare facilities available for employees at Google and then also um, they have a uh, parent, um, mother and father both um, leave of absence, paid 100% for six months um, when the mother, when a child is born. And um, this gives the mother an opportunity to work um, after the birth of the child, and then feel like they're still part of the team. So um, in today's world, all the mothers work. And I think it was my era that things changed. And back in my era in the 1960s, mothers didn't work. And um, so the world has changed. And I think we have to go along with that change. Thank you. Uh, moving to respect. Uh, the biggest mistake most people assume is that, and I, I've taken this from, from your book as well. The biggest mistake most parents assume is that a child when he's a child, will be a clone of him and think like you think and we forget that he or she is a completely different individual. Uh, development needs, and this is from your book, development needs a deeper layer of respect, accepting a child for who he is and letting his life unfold accordingly. Uh, we want to shed some light, and I know this for sure because many doctors would want their child to be doctors. Uh, they just see their own reflection in them and then they imagine their careers the way they imagine, but the child thinks completely differently. So how do you avoid this conundrum? Well, again, I think it's respect for the fact that the child has their own interests and their own needs. And it's really important for parents to realize that. And the child, I mean, the child can look just like your father or just like your mother and actually behave in many ways just like that person. Um, and you might not like that, to be honest. Uh, so, but what you have to remember is all children, they're like a gift from life, from God. And they are, they're like, if you just think about the analogy, they're like plants. You know, they, they bloom the way that they were supposed to bloom. And you spend a lot of time trying to change that blooming pattern. Uh, it creates problems. Uh, so it's important, you know, if you see that your child's going to have some serious issues, like be ultra shy or, you know, ultra aggressive, either one on that. So you have to modify that or help them live more effectively. But um, for the most part, I think parents take, I think you had a question earlier, parents take this 
as a serious responsibility that it's their their role to make the child into something important it's kind of like they think of the child as a piece of clay and if they don't mold that piece of clay well it, it's not going to be able to function the way that they want it to function um you know that piece of clay has built in dna and um and a lot of that is is going to it's going to play out the way that it was meant to play out it's very difficult to change that thank you um so especially when you're raising a child passionately for years and the child has been listening to you and he has been a very nice child eventually that there, there is going to come a point of time where inevitably uh, your child exerts his or her independence and doesn't listen to you isn't it her, yes. her imagination of the future doesn't align with what you imagine uh, so how do you deal with it and how can you let children make their own mistakes especially when you're sure that it's their own mistakes and i want to take that from example from your life as well so your daughter she went to yale uh, did her medicine and came back and she wanted to be a um a babysitter babysitter <laughs> i and, could not believe that oh and my god it's it's a crazy thing that, that she's doing but at what point do you put your foot down and at what point you let them make their mistakes yes well that was a little bit stressful for for me yeah she had this great degree from yale university that cost a fortune of course and then she came home and decided she wanted to be a babysitter and then she put up an advertisement and of course she was like inundated with people who wanted her to babysit um she became the most popular babysitter on the campus Tampa, <laughs> that's where we live and then i tried i was like and there must be something else you want to do nope that was it so um it was just slow little hints there was this job fair i said why don't you go to this job fair and just check it out just see what it's like and so she went to this job fair that's what they used to have back then job fairs and um she came back she's like i didn't see anything i liked really a whole day and not a single thing you liked nope so then it turns out that she had met somebody there who liked her and then called up and said you know we'd like to interview you in new york and she was like really new york and then she found out they wanted to put her up at this really fancy hotel i forgot the name helmsley i think she did not go to new york because she wanted a job she went to new york because she wanted to stay in this hotel <laughs> i was like oh my god i can't believe it Anyway, she got this amazing job offer and she came back and she told them called them and said, "Nope. I I'm not I don't want to take their job offer." I mean, it was pretty I and she was like on babysitting some more. She did that for another month. I couldn't believe it. And uh finally one day, just out of the blue, one day out of the blue, she said to me, you know, do you think they still have that job offer in New York? I don't know what could have happened. You know, maybe 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 the babies weren't being very good. I don't know what the deal was. But she called them up and they said, "Well, we've been waiting for you to call back." So, yeah, she took the job offer and that was the beginning of her career. And uh turns out they hired her to be the head of a biotech fund. And um, Yeah, but it was a long I just had to be patient. You know, sometimes patience really pays off and it certainly paid off in that case. And um yeah, so she <laughs> she did really well in New York. She was there 10 years. She worked in finance and then started her own company. Right. So so how do you decide whether to allow them to make their own mistakes? and went to put your foot down and say that you know this mistake is going to be very costly i cannot let her make let her or him make this mistake and i just need to protect them i think once first of all if they're hurting themselves in some way i think that that's a red flag 
if they're not paying, if there's no income, if they're just staying home and you're continuing to support them, that's also bad. Um, you know, Anne could have easily paid for her stay at home. You know, she's earning a lot of money as a babysitter. Um, but so that wasn't a good criteria. It was just that, um, you know, I, I kept trying to drop ideas without being too forceful because a lot of parents, you know, when your child is 16, 17, 18 years old, they come up with all these ideas that really give you a heart attack. You know, they're trying to be independent. And I and the analogy is, you know, it's like a bird leaving the nest. If they don't do that at the, during their teenage years, if somehow or other they end up being the perfect child, doing exactly what you want, that is actually a scary sign because they are then going to want to stay with you when they're 20 and 25. And you read about kids that haven't really launched, you know, that they're still living at home. They're doing what the parents want, but they're living at home. You don't want to miss that drive for independence in the teenage years. It's instinctual. I think it's just part of human nature. And so they're going to make you mad and they're going to do things that make you upset. And just don't, don't squash it. You know, allow it to happen uh, as long as they're not hurting themselves, as long as they're not spending fortune, um, you know, doing it. I mean, like, for example, I have one of my grandchildren right now. I know it gave my daughter a little bit of a heart attack. So they opened up California a little bit. So she decided that she wanted to go to the mountains. Now, you know, the mountains like three, four hours away, drive. She's 18. And so this is not exactly, doesn't make everybody feel very secure. Let's put it that way. Um, and it was tough, but we let her do it. And so there she is. She's there right now as I'm speaking, you know, and heaven help. I hope she's doing something good there with, you know, staying in some place that's nice and, you know, with people that don't have COVID-19 or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's, in today's world, it's even harder to trust because it could have a negative, really negative impact. Right. Um, so, but we have to do it. I have a question from a friend of mine, uh, a very old friend, Rajesh Banwal. He's from Pune and he says that Easter, my 12 year old girl loves reading books and sometimes is lost in searching. I get lost in searching good books for her. What kind of book she should read? So the we can expand this on the kind of influences that you want to expose your child to have a, a proper, well-rounded growth. So did you have to take a, a lot of care on what kind of books and media your, your, when you're raising your kid or your grandkid should be exposed to? How do you take care of that? I Yes, I was always somebody that recommended books. And um, I gave them, an, they could, we went to the library, I let them pick the books they wanted, but I was always suggesting books to them. And I'm still doing that. Um, there's thousands of books out there. There's a lot of lists online, like the best books for teenagers or the best history books or the best. So I always made those books available. As far as media goes, I did not, I was very, careful with media in spite of what a lot of people say. Um, I did not let my children watch violent movies. I, I think that violence um, is, you know, you become um, hardened to it. And so um, I never did let that happen. I, and I know that there's a lot of studies that say it doesn't matter if you let your kids, but I disagree. I think that you need, there's certain things that you should control. And, um, and I think violent movies or movies where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of anger or rape or killing, I just not, I don't think that's good for kids to watch. Um, so is that, did I answer that question or was there something else, Robbie, that I should be saying? No, I, I think that answers. Thank you so much. Uh, 
with with respect to independence uh, you said that don't the, the book has the title don't do anything for children that they can do for themselves could you elaborate that uh, a bit it's so obvious you know we do so many things for our kids all the time make their bed you know uh, we feed them we make them meals we take care of all their needs at home you know why are we doing all that they can learn to do a lot of this themselves um as a matter of fact they had a uh, course that was required last year at the university of california it was called adulting and what this was is a course in teaching kids how to take care of themselves including you know how to do their own finances you know how to wash the laundry you know how to plan your meals all this sort of stuff things around the house where you're working really hard you the parent hey your your kids are part of the team they can also do it and um as a matter of fact now that we're all stuck at home you know there's a lot of things that you can teach them to do and maybe they can get rid of that adulting course at UC Berkeley um so that is that's one thing um i i think that in addition to just things around the the home i think that kids can um they're more trustworthy than you can imagine they know a lot of stuff about tech they know more about tech than you will ever believe and so you can ask them to help out and do things connected with technology you know if ever i have a new program that we're using in school that i don't know how to use i was like i just give it to them and i was like could you come back tomorrow or the next day and tell me how to use that and they know how so i think um it's a way of thinking it's a new you know that a lot of people as you know um kids uh you know adults over the age of 50 or 60 are tech challenged and kids can help them be more tech savvy so that's those are a couple things got it i, I yeah, it's a mindset also in india that we do not uh, expose children to work uh, early uh, or be independent early and we 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 uh, think they are kids and they should not be doing it and we overdo things for them uh, but that's a great idea yes stop doing it because you know they they feel like they feel empowered you know while we think that's work they think that's that's something fun to do and so let them do it right so is the 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 times when you raised your children and the times now a lot has changed right every generation comes up with its own set of challenges there is more uncertainty there uh, the acceleration of change is more there uh so so your lesson your principles that you presented in the book are they still relevant uh, and also culturally uh, are, are the principles culturally agnostic and also in in time frame of how it is it's also agnostic and still hold true i just wanted to know from you i think these principles are culturally agnostic there is not a culture in the world that does not want to promote trust and respect if you take a look at every single religion every single one they all promote love thy neighbor and they all promote compassion and kindness and there's not there's not a single one out there i think what happened in a lot of the interpretations of some of the the different sects they've interpreted differently and then they end up fighting with each other about like their interpretation but the basis is of every single religion and all cultures is really take care of each other you know honesty forgiveness love compassion and that's why what i'm talking about trust respect independence collaboration kindness there is not a culture out there that doesn't believe that there it's not male dependent female dependent it's it's for everybody and it works at all ages it works for children it works in the classroom when they're in school and it works in the workplace you know if you trust 
and respect your employees and give them a lot of independence. If they know that you trust and believe in them, they will work with passion for you. And the times that people don't do that is when they feel like the company doesn't understand them or the people around them are um, inhospitable or don't won't help them or won't forgive them or, you know, all those things. Yes, this works at all ages, all cultures, all levels. Thank you. Um, in, in the, you also have a chapter on grit and grit is my favorite topic too. You said grit is a teachable skill. H how do you teach grit? You give, you teach grit by giving kids an opportunity to re redo, to iterate, to fail repeatedly without negative consequences. So, um, for example, in my in the journalism program, kids revise and revise and revise until they get it right. So they have, and they get to do it on their own. So it's grit that makes them want to do it. This also happens in my English classes, happened in my social studies. I also taught math. You know, kids will work really hard to understand a math problem. And there's a lot of help online. I mean, Khan Academy is your number one example. If you want to learn how to do certain math problems, check Khan Academy. Every single thing. So if they believe in themselves and if they believe and their ability to learn, that's the key. They have to believe that they are capable of doing it, and then they will have grit. And um, Carol Dweck talks about mindset, and you're, the, the fact that in the 1950s and 60s, people thought that intelligence was fixed, that you were born with it, and you couldn't ever change that. Today, we are aware of the fact that it's your mindset. If you think you can do it, you can do it. And that is one of the things that is very important. So you want to instill in your children the fact that they can do anything they set their mind to do. Thank you. So we have a last couple of questions. I, we are also running out of time, uh, another 10 minutes or so. The underlying theme in your book is, uh, is that uh, you model the ideal behavior for your children to pick, okay? <laughs> yes, but that's it, true. You do model this behavior, you know, so is, if- yes. Is that taking too much pressure on you because you have to like walk the talk the whole life for your children to see and uh, observe you and- It is a lot of pressure, but listen, let's put it this way. If you want your children to be patient, you cannot be impatient because they are gonna copy you. Children copy what they see. Um, and you don't have to tell them, oh, copy me. They just do it. It's automatic. It's part of the way they think. So yes, they do copy you. And so one of the things, if you have some bad habits that you don't want your children to copy is you can sit down with them and talk to them about it. Like for example, smoking. If you smoke and you can't break the habit, you can tell them this is terrible, you wish you could have broken it, and you're working really hard to get rid of it. Um, so you can admit your weaknesses and tell them that you hope that they will not have to suffer through the same things that you've suffered through. Um, but yes, I'm sorry, you do have to model this. And um, yeah, <laughs> you know, if you're interested in learning, they will be interested in learning. And I think one thing that's great about the Indian culture and what I've seen from all my students from India is that India values education. I never have to convince people that, I mean, they're, they come into class, I already know. So it's like, yes, I love these people. And so, <laughs> so I think that that's one of the number one strengths that people in India have is that education is considered paramount, important. And, you know, reading and understanding and every generation can improve on the preceding generation. Sure. And I think so, that's good. Thank you. 
So there is an implicit acceptance of the fact that uh, successful parents raise successful children, right? Um, what if yeah. parents, what if parents themselves haven't amounted much in life? Uh, they might feel inadequate. How can we raise successful children? Do you have examples from your life where the parents might not have been uh, very successful, but they were able to raise very successful children? Because uh, this this can help some of the parents uh, to to think highly of their kids. I think that I actually there are studies that show that children coming out of very stressful households have somehow achieved even more. Mm. And so you need to take a look at those studies. Um, you, you look at uh, very some very famous people who have had very difficult childhoods. And so I just have to look at myself that I had a very stressful childhood and I managed to, to make it out. Um, it'd be interesting to take a look at the history of a lot of CEOs in the, this country, in America, and you will see that they had very difficult times. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is one of a Supreme Court justice in the United States. And if you look at her, her childhood, it was difficult. Um, so people coming out of poverty or coming out of difficult childhoods, um, you, you know, if you are living in situations that you wish you weren't living in, you can still have a lot of hope for your children because as long as they have hope and belief in themselves and a trust, trust and respect for their own abilities, they will do really well. And I gave you the example of um, Elon Musk, but I was also friends with Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs was, he was given up for adoption as a child. Mm. And it wasn't when he was just born. And he was had a very difficult childhood. He didn't go to college. I don't know if you know that. He just, um, and look at the look at what he achieved in life so just because you aren't providing a perfect place uh, for your child to grow up doesn't mean that they won't achieve great things especially if you believe in them and give them that opportunity and as i said earlier if they make a mistake you have to give them the opportunity to apologize and you have to forgive and that is, that's one of the most important things because when people are angry and carry anger around with them for life, the person that suffers is the person who carries that anger. And so it's important to remember that. Thank you. Um, what are the ways to raise uh, academically less inclined students? Because uh, there are going to be students who might not be doing great academically. And uh, say, for example, in a class of 45, uh, there are toppers and then there are those uh, uh, middle uh, students. And then there's somebody who's, who's uh, going to take the 45th place in the class, right? Um, so how do you, what are, and then the parents get very anxious that they might not amount much in their lives. Um, so what is the hope, hope there? And I also, one of my favorite uh, quotes was, you cannot expect a fish to climb a tree, remember? Yes. So, so this in context. So what are your ways? Uh, what would your suggestion be to parents whose children might not be academically uh, great? So I just want to tell you, especially parents of boys. So I would like you to know that the majority of boys that have been in my class have not been academic superstars. In fact, they're the number one kids that forget to turn in their homework. They have poor handwriting. They're distracted. They're, they're doing all kinds of things. And I can tell you something interesting that happens to boys. About the age of 16 or 17, those boys that were totally distracted, that didn't do what they were supposed to do, they somehow come around and do well. And one thing that I have always done is support them 
no matter what. And that is why I have today hundreds of men who believe in my program that are passionate about it because those young men, they just don't develop at the same rate that you want them to. But honestly, they're going to be amazing people. And don't give up on them. Um, I think it's really important. You know, they could be the class clown, like you said, or, you know, the last person. But this this thing that I'm going to bring to India, hopefully, is called Waj International, which will be a teaching methodology to help sort of level the playing field and give kids an opportunity to develop at the rate that they develop and be successful when it's their turn. And, you know, some kids are really smart and develop early at age 10 or 11 or 12. And then there's kids that all of a sudden, you know, the light goes on when they're 15 or 18 or something. Don't give up on your child. Honestly, they will succeed no matter yeah. what. Thank you. Yeah, they, they are the late bloomers. And I've seen a lot of late bloomers, especially in careers. A um, lot, of, lot of late bloomers. You know, um, some, of the, some of the leaders of tech industry today were late bloomers. Okay, just think about that. Nice. <laughs> All right, so we have like, last five minutes. I'll quickly uh, pick one question on uh, focus. And this is a bane of the current time. So we have two, two people asking the same question on fake focus. How can we help our children to stay focused, especially there's so much of distraction that they have to manage, which is something that the parents might not have uh, gone through when they were growing up. Uh, so how can you help the teens from keep losing focus and not get distracted? Do you have figured out the ways to do this, to manage this? Okay, so one number one thing going on in this pandemic is that people are totally stressed and they've lost focus. And I think one of the after effects, if we ever find a vaccine or whatever, is going to be the mental health crisis that people are going to suffer as a result of this. So you need to make sure that your child feels like they're not alone, that we're all somewhat disfo- you know, distracted. It's very hard for us to focus because we don't know where we're going and how it's going to turn out. But so, I, again, I think understanding, communication, talking to them, and being, um, being a friend and giving them an opportunity in whatever classes they're doing to connect with a friend. You know, a lot of this Zoom classes that I'm sure is going on in India, too, um, you know, it's one class after another after another where they're listening this doesn't work it didn't work when it was in the school and it doesn't work now so give them an opportunity to go online and to connect with their friends you know just have a zoom friend talk or a facetime friend talk we all need we're all social animals and we need our social um, abilities to function so i think in, instead of you know, criticizing them and yelling at them for not being able to focus. I think you should just be more understanding and just have them come up with a schedule of their choice, perhaps collaboratively with you, and see whether or not that doesn't happen. Or maybe they can come up with a schedule with their friends that they want to do. It's hard, you know, the world is, it's a very difficult place right now. And it's, hopefully going to get better, but I think it might get worse before it gets better because no one knows what we're doing. Right. So it, it's uh, we have run out of uh, questions here, but before we end this, uh, we promised to uh, pick one of our watchers, whoever asked the questions. So is the, you might not remember their names, but do you remember the question that you like the most so that we can send them your, your book uh, as a gift uh, for asking these amazing questions? Well, they've all been amazing questions, so it's a really tough one <laughs> to ask. But, you know, I kind of liked that question that came from the woman about um, 
The bullying? A bullying, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So that came from uh, Sonal. Sonal Partak from Dallas. That's a, tar that's a tough question. And hopefully I gave some, uh, you know, an answer that I thought hopefully will help more people. So Sonal, you, you, you won yourself uh, a free book. And uh, to all the audience out here, I must tell you, uh, we barely scratched the surface of the book. Okay, it's, the book is insightful. In fact, I could not stop myself from gifting it to my sister. I was in the first chapter and I immediately uh, went to Amazon and sent her a copy. I would, I would uh, urge all of you to, to pick the book and read it because we could not do justice to the book in within one and a half hours of conversation. There's a ton of uh, more insight there. Uh, so yeah, so that's how it is. So thank you, Esther, for your time. This was wonderful uh, uh, and tons of insights in this conversation. And you answered a lot of questions from our listeners as well. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I wish all the people everywhere, especially the listeners here, to have you know more a sense of peace and calm as a result of we will get through this all together if children will help. May I ask a bonus question here because this is something which is not related to parenting but relating to your attitude to life. Yes. Uh, you you have nine grandchildren. Ten. And ten grandchildren. And yes. You, you seem to be still a born of fire. You're, you're still starting so many new projects. You are in your 70s. What keeps you going and where does that energy come from? You know, I, I love people and I love spending time with people and helping them. And I think the energy comes from the sense that I can help and I can give people more of an opportunity to live a better life. I mean, I lived in poverty. I know what it was like. And I lived in as a you know student without a lot of money. I've had a lot of life experiences. And I think have, being optimistic is really the best way to go. I mean, the alternative is to be a pessimist and that sounds pretty bad to me. So, and staying active, oh my God, we all need to do that to help each other. The older people have the wisdom. Yes. My, my previous guest, one of my previous guests, Chip Conley, uh, who, who runs the Elderly Academy, I think, uh, he, he talks about this, uh, the of the, which is much more valuable to the world. So thank you, uh, Esther, to, to pass on your wisdom. The world needs it more than ever before and keep the energy uh, flowing. Thanks again. Thank you. All the best, everyone. And to all the guests, we'll be back next week with another inspiring guest. He's Yancy Strickler. He's the co-founder. Um, of Kickstarter and I can't wait uh, to meet him next week. So please, I welcome you again next week, same time and the same YouTube channel. See you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Hope -bye. Oh, it's the